you. Um, so this is uh, Karine Colivris. Col Col I hope I did that right, Karine. Um, she is a professor of geography at Virginia Tech and specifically works as a medical geographer or a spatial epidemi epidemiologist. Her research is broadly focused on spatial patterns of emerging, emerging infectious diseases. And she and her students have studied Lyme diseases southward expansion for over a decade. So there you go, Ms. Corrine, where are you? I am here, I think. I'm about to share my screen, so hey. hopefully we can get that viewed. All right, is my screen visible to everyone? Yes. Okay, <laughs> great. Um, so thank you, Barb, for that introduction, and thanks for inviting me. Um, I was really happy to see your email a few months ago when we first started talking about this. And um, I guess one good thing about the pandemic is that we can reach more people with this virtual format. Um, so I, I love talking about my research on emerging infectious diseases. And um, like Barb said, I've been studying Lyme disease for over a decade now. Um, while Lyme disease spreads in a very different way than COVID, I think the past year has increased interest in infectious diseases in general. Um, and, and as I'm, I'm sharing my presentation and my thoughts, um, if you have any questions that come up, you know, I don't know what the normal format is for this meeting, but I'm happy to answer questions along the way or um, save them to the end. So whatever, whatever works for you. Yeah, how about if we put things in the chat and then we'll look at it at the end? Sounds great. Sounds like a good Thank plan. You. Thanks. Right. Um, so some of you may not be familiar with the idea of geography as a research discipline. Um, so I'm, I'm a geographer and I work in BT's geography department. So I'll briefly share where geography fits into this idea of understanding diseases. Um, generally speaking, geographers study why things are where they are using different technologies like geographic information systems, um, statistics, or even surveys or, and interviews. Um, medical geographers or spatial epidemiologists like me um, use these methods to study why diseases are where they are, how they spread from place to place, and the unique environmental features that might constrain them or contribute to their spread. So as I've, I've mentioned, I'm a medical geographer, spatial epidemiologist that studies environmental factors related to disease emergence. And in this case, the term emergence refers to the spread of a new disease or the spread of a known disease into a new area. So COVID-19 is an emerging disease as it's brand new to humans. Um, Lyme disease is considered to be an emerging disease as well because its range continues to expand. And that's the story that I'll be sharing in this presentation, understanding links uh, between Lyme disease and land cover at multiple spatial scales. So when I share a story um, on an emerging disease or a specific outbreak, I often wonder when and where to begin. Um, typically, it's a series of events that coalesce in a specific place and time to result in that perfect storm that is a disease outbreak. Um, there are public health officials and scientists right now madly trying to figure out exactly what events led to COVID um, you know, out, uh, becoming so um, common and spreading into a pandemic. So in the case of Lyme disease, I, I have to ask myself, when and where did that story begin? So we might think to begin the story in Connecticut, where in 1975, a, a cluster of juvenile arthritis cases were identified by pediatricians in the suburban areas around Lyme, Connecticut. So little kids shouldn't be developing joint pain in multiple areas of their bodies, especially in a cluster with multiple cases. So that raised a red flag for health professionals. And just as a side note, um, the World Health Organization no longer names diseases after places because of the stigma that can result. Um, so thus COVID-19 was given a name that reflects the virus that causes it along with the year in which it emerged instead of a name that reflects a particular place in which it popped up. But Lyme disease maintains its name after this place of Lyme, Connecticut, um, as that was a common practice a few decades ago. 
So there were earlier manifestations of this disease that had different names and different a different type of syndromes, for example, based on the symptoms that were caused. You know, this multiple joint uh, joint pain in multiple joints that comes and goes and other things. Uh, but at the time, the cause was unknown. But when kids started developing joint pain, there was suddenly increased motivation and increased scientific awareness in the need to identify the underlying cause of those symptoms. So much research followed since the mid 70s. And by 1982, a scientist with the last name of Bergdorfer isolated that bacterium that causes Lyme disease. And Borrelia burgdorferi is now known as the pathogen that causes human illness. And around the same time, it was recognized that this bacterium is transmitted by ticks, Ixodes scapularis, or the black-legged tick in the east. And the CDC in this image helpfully placed these various life stages of the tick on FDR's face on the dime for scale. So they're quite small. And then the final piece of the puzzle is where did the tick get the bacterium? So mammals and even birds can serve as the reservoir or the underlying source of infection for ticks. And the most competent reservoir in the Eastern US is considered to be the white-footed mouse. And what do I mean by competent in this case? Um, well, a laboratory study uh, found that if a white-footed mouse is infected with the bacterium, 90% of the time, black-legged ticks that feed on it will become infected themselves and then able to transmit it to humans. And you'll notice that deer are not listed on this slide because they actually don't serve as a reservoir or an underlying source of infection for ticks. But they are important hosts for ticks who mate and feed on the deer. And therefore, deer are considered very important in the maintenance of tick populations. Deer can also transport ticks relatively long distances throughout um, the, the deer's home range. So all of this means that Lyme disease is a zoonosis. It's an animal disease. It spreads amongst mammals and likely birds by way of a tick bite. So humans are basically an accidental infection of this animal disease and we also can't serve as a reservoir. So if I have a raging Lyme disease infection right now and a tick bites me, that tick will not pick up the bacterium from me. An animal reservoir like the white-footed mouse is necessary. So every single human infection of Lyme disease is actually a separate spillover event, a situation where um, a zoonotic or animal disease has spilled over or ended up in humans. So how does that spill over to humans happen? So this diagram looks complicated and a little convoluted, but we'll step through it. Uh, we'll go through it step by step. Um, so we'll start in the middle when a tick lays her eggs in the spring. So when those eggs then hatch, that tick is not actually infected with the bacterium. So in order for that tick to become infected, it needs to cross paths with an infected reservoir. So as that tick continues developing after it hatches from the egg, it takes a blood meal at the larval stage. So if that larval, larval tick happens to feed on an infected animal, like an infected white-footed mouse, for example, that tick may then become infected with the bacterium. So then the tick continues growing through the fall. They overwinter. They can survive um, pretty cold temperatures. And we arrive in the spring of the following year when the tick is about a year old. So at the nymph stage, the tick takes another blood meal. And then again, later in that same year um, at the adult stage. So if the tick became infected during a previous blood meal and then feeds on a human at a later stage, then that bacterium could be transmitted to that person. So this is a little bit of the, the complicated life cycle um, that ticks have, but that's how this spillover event happens, where an uninfect, uninfected tick hatches from the egg, eventually picks up the bacterium and possibly then feeds at a later date on a human and possibly transfers that bacterium. <laughs> 
So with that bit of background on the animals involved, I'll return to Lyme disease's emergent story, which again, I started back in Lyme, Connecticut in 1975 when it was first identified. But as I tell the story, we actually need to move farther back in time um, because it turns out that 1975 is actually not the beginning of Lyme disease's story. It just is the beginning of when we identified its cause and, and recognized it. So prior to European contact, um, Native Americans definitely had an impact on the environment and used its resources. But generally speaking, Eastern forests were relatively intact. But with European settlement, trees were an important resource that helped, bu helped build our colonial towns and cities um, in the East. So the European settlement of the Eastern seaboard required a lot of wood. Um, here we have a painting of work being done on the wooden hauled old iron sides in a shipyard in Massachusetts. So building ships required wood. Um, next is a view of the state house and other buildings made out of wood in Boston in 1793. And the last example is a contemporary photo of surviving homes from the colonial era in Rhode Island made with wood siding. So while brick and stone were important in building colonial and post-independent cities and structures, wood was very cheap, readily available. And furthermore, the land needed to be cleared anyway for farms to feed the growing population. So thus the East Coast went through a period of deforestation um, after European settlement. Um, also at this time, as land was being cleared for farms and trees um, were cleared to build cities and industry, there was a significant amount of deer hunting that occurred by both humans as well as their non-human predators. So deer populations were kept relatively in, checked, in check. So these are all pieces of the puzzle that form the beginning of Lyme disease's story. In time though, farms, in the Northeast and the East were abandoned or became smaller as the country expanded and agricultural development um, occurred elsewhere in the country and construction uh, materials shifted away from the use of, of timber somewhat, more toward metal and, and other resources. So we entered a period actually of reforestation along um, the East Coast. So this map, um, released by the US Forest Service shows changes in forest density between 1873 and 2001. So the areas in pale green or dark green experienced a moderate or major increase respectively in forest cover. And the, those shades of green illustrate that reforestation that the Northeast experienced. But then the question is, well, in what way or in what configuration did that reforestation occur? So I'm gonna take an aside before I jump into that and share the idea that generally speaking, reforestation is considered to be a good thing. We need trees for healthy ecosystems. They also improve human health and so on. And also deforestation has been linked to disease emergence in other parts of the world. So reforestation might do the, the opposite, right? And help control diseases. Well, actually there lies a bit of a paradox with Lyme disease. So this restore, reforestation that occurred in New England has been linked to Lyme disease's emergence because it's not just forest cover, but rather the specific configuration of those forests that have been implicated in Lyme disease. It's how the forest grew back. So therein lies a contradiction we might see with disease prevention or control, um, sometimes an activity or a feature that is beneficial for ecosystems or other aspects of human health might actually contribute to disease emergence. So if we get back to this story of Lyme disease specifically emerging, um, as reforestation occurred, did the forests grow back into the intact forests that they once were? like the picture of the Adirondacks, which weren't significantly disturbed historically on the left? Or did they grow back in more of a patchwork of forest fragments like this image outside of Albany, New York on the right? So for the most part, definitely the picture on the right, um, many of our settlements continued growing and many forested areas returned in a patchy way. 
So as reforestation was, was occurring, we also killed off um, some of the natural predators of deer, such as wolves, and we started to regulate hunting. So in many Eastern states, we've seen deer populations spiral ever upwards. And so this history, uh, basically this natural history of forests and um, Lyme disease set the stage for the disease to spill over into humans at a significant enough level for the disease to be identified in the mid 70s. So within the field of medical geography and where it overlaps into ecology and other related fields, there's a research framework called landscape epidemiology. And it gets at the idea that certain landscape characteristics can constrain diseases to certain areas um, by constraining the environment in which the vectors like the ticks, the reservoir like the white-footed mouse or hosts like deer or humans can survive. So just as an example, other than Lyme disease, um, malaria is present in certain areas where a specific mosquito species survives. However, we modify the landscape. We modify the environment in which we live. We're part of this environment. Um, and that landscape modification can interfere with processes that constrain diseases to certain places. So our actions can either prevent or possibly allow the establishment of disease transmission cycles. So with that broader discussion about landscape modification and disease, I'd like to return to Lyme disease and think about how Lyme disease has emerged since the 1970s and has continued emerging. So this map produced by the CDC, the Centers for Disease Control, I used to have to explain what the CDC was, but I think we're all familiar with it these days. Um, this map shows a dot for each reported Lyme disease case within the county in which it was reported. In 2001, this is about 26 years after the disease was first recognized, cases were really clustered along the northeastern seaboard, and there was a secondary epicenter or outbreak area in the upper Midwest. So this was what things looked like about yeah, 20 years ago. Just five years later, we're starting to see a bit of an expansion, a geographic expansion in both areas. Um, in the, in uh, the Northeast, the upper Northeast there, we're seeing the northward movement. We're seeing the identification of cases north um, toward Canada, toward the Western part of the region, as well as to the South. And then the Midwestern zone is expanding as well. And now if we bump ahead all the way to the most recent map, so finally by 2018, um, this is the most recent year that the CDC has made their case distribution maps available, um, the diseases range has expanded considerably in all directions. So um, viewing those changes in an animation, like in an, in an animated map on the next slide is going to allow us to visualize this expansion of Lyme disease especially into this part of Virginia. And we're, we're gonna zoom in um, and think about Virginia specifically. So as this map series begins, uh, again, you'll, you can visualize that expansion in all directions. And then if you turn your eye toward Virginia, you'll see over time the number of cases in the Shenandoah Valley and finally down into the New River Valley um, increase over the past 20 years. So we have definitely seen a movement of Lyme disease into this area. So the reported number of cases in the US has clearly increased over this time period. This is 96 to 2018. Um, across the US, as well as in Virginia from 2004 to 2018, we've seen um, a general increase. And actually thinking about these numbers, so we see about um, on the US map 30,000 to 40,000 cases each year, but a study about five years ago that was published in a CDC journal indicates that the true number of Lyme disease cases is probably an order of magnitude higher. So instead of 30 or 40,000 cases, there are probably actually more like 300,000 or 400,000 cases 
um, because it's thought that a considerable number go unreported. So then specifically zooming into Virginia, we can see that 20 years ago, our sprinkling of cases um, was definitely concentrated in Northern Virginia. There were a few other cases scattered throughout the state. At the time, those were being attributed to travel. You know, somebody, there is a dot in Montgomery County for 2001. So, oh, that person may have gone up to Northern Virginia or elsewhere in the region and gone hiking and been bitten by a tick and it was reported to Montgomery County. It was thought at that time that Lyme disease is not present in our state. Um, I moved here and started at VT in 2004. And just a few years after that, our vet said, yeah, Lyme disease is here. Even if the human doctors don't recognize it, we see it in our dogs. And you know, so we, we started talking more about Lyme disease prevention. So a few years later, uh, by 2006, we definitely saw a bit of an expansion in Virginia. There are cases um, identified in Lynchburg, in Richmond, um, and in the southeastern part of the state. So those were the areas of concern um, around 2006. So if we see Lynchburg, Richmond in the southeast, as well as um, still, still the northern, northern Virginia area. And then finally, four years after that, that's a big jump from 2006 to 2010 we definitely saw the New River Valley become a hot spot at that time. And the Shenandoah Valley clearly stood out as well um, in that area. So this was around the time that um, the Virginia state entomologist at the Department of Health contacted a few of us here at Virginia Tech and helped us assemble this team um, to try to better understand what was contributing to this movement, the spread of Lyme disease in Virginia. So these, um, these Roanoke Times maps have, have adjusted the case count for population, which means you can kind of compare apples and apples here. So the total in the NRV is even more obvious here from you know, that shift from 2008 to 2016. And to me, what also stands out is something I didn't notice at first, and that's the value for the highest category on the map. So in 2008, the highest category, the darkest shade of red there in Northern Virginia represented 100 to 133 cases per 100,000 people in that adjustment. But by 2016, the highest category, that same dark red shade present in Southwestern Virginia here is a rate for 100 to 469 cases per 100,000. So that's, you know, that's a big jump. Um, and we definitely saw um, that big increase reflected in the, the specific numbers when we zoomed in for this region. So most of the research for Lyme disease has been done in the Northeast. That's where the disease was first identified. Um, it was considered to be you know, a, a disease that was present and circulating each year. So much of the research was focused there. Um, and research in the Northeast recognizes that there's this association between Lyme disease and fragmented forests. So it's thought that deer like to seek shelter in the forested areas and then come out and forage for food in agricultural areas and cropland and my own garden. Um, and the white-footed mouse also thrives in forest fragments as well. So when a tick does feed on an animal within a forest fragment, it's more likely to be feeding on a competent reservoir than some other animal, just because the white-footed mouse really thrives in those fragments. But again, the bulk of this research was done in the Northeast. And the question was, as Lyme disease spread southward, we wanted to know if the relationships between Lyme disease and the surrounding environment and the landscape um, continued even as it moved southward. So one possible explanation for this link with forest fragmentation is related to the dilution effect and biodiversity um, out of ecology and biology. So in this figure that was done on a study of Lyme disease in Maryland, actually, back in 2006, both of these landscapes are 50-50 forest cover and herbaceous cover, like grass, meadows, or cropland. But you can see that their configuration is very different. The image on the left has a large intact forest patch, and the image on the right has the forest interspersed with that herbaceous cover. So how does that relate to Lyme disease? Um, 
And there, there's been a number of studies looking at this idea of the dilution effect. And that's not my area of expertise, but we draw on that research um, in, in the work that we did here. So an intact forest is generally considered to have higher levels of biodiversity. There would be a greater number of different species present and a greater number of individuals within those species than what we would see in a forest fragment. So in a forest fragment, there will likely be fewer individuals of different species, fewer different species represented. But the white-footed mouse, again, which is a very competent reservoir or source of the bacterium, thrives in these small fragments. And I'm not suggesting that we um, don't have a variety of animals in a fragment. I have squirrels, raccoons, and skunks in my neighborhood um, near the Kroger on South Main. But generally speaking, a forest fragment has lower biodiversity. And then that raises the question, um, you know, in which of these forest configurations is a tick more likely to feed on a white-footed mouse? Well, in the forest fragment, because in the intact forest, there are a lot of different species in that higher level of biodiversity that the tick could feed on for a blood meal, and lower biodiversity in that fragment means it's more likely to end up feeding on a white-footed mouse, which is the more competent reservoir. And then lastly, when we plunk houses down in these landscapes, we can see that the, the risk of human Lyme disease would be higher in that fragmented landscape where we have um, a greater likelihood that the tick would feed on one of those more competent reservoirs. So all of that background then brings me to this, our study in Virginia, which was funded by the National Science Foundation's Geography and Spatial Sciences Program. Um, I'm not gonna go into all the nitty gritty details of the study. Um, I'm gonna talk about the things that I, I find the most interesting, but I'm happy to share any nitty gritty details. Um, so we used case data from Virginia for a five year period that was standardized by population. So we adjusted for the fact that there are more people in Northern Virginia. So of course we'll see more cases in Northern Virginia. So we, we adjusted for population and we compared it to land cover across the state. So in this land cover map, which is from 2000 and usually these maps are developed every five years. Sorry, this map's from 2006. Um, these maps are developed every five or so years. Um, this was one that we used in our study um, that was an earlier land cover map. Um, what you see on this map is our towns and cities, places with high levels of impervious surfaces, show up as pink or red. Then herbaceous areas are generally yellow and brown, so places where we have pasture, meadows, um, cultivated crops. And then lastly, forested areas are green. So you can see throughout parts of the state, we have some, some really patchy areas. And then especially along the mountains, along the west, we see those large swaths of intact forests, which um, you know, some of them are, are forest service land, um, and they're just generally less patchy than closer to urban areas. So we collaborated with statisticians to analyze these relationships between cases and land cover. So our main findings are going to be summarized here, and I have four main points that I'll, I'll share with you. So first, we found that high levels of herbaceous cover, so high levels of pasture land, cropland, grassy areas, are also places that had high numbers of Lyme disease cases. And then not surprisingly, we kind of found the inverse, places with high levels of development, like you know, College and Main Street, downtown Blacksburg, uh, those places with high levels of development would have a low number of Lyme disease cases because in that specific zoomed in location, those areas generally don't support the disease transmission cycle. But then we moved on to considering the boundaries between these different land cover types. So it's one thing to look at how much herbaceous cover is, is there or how much development is there, but what about the boundaries between these different places? So we moved on to considering those edges and where we found a high presence or a long perimeter of a boundary between herbaceous and forest land, we found a high number of Lyme disease cases. And then we saw the opposite when we were looking at herbaceous cover uh, the, the boundary between herbaceous cover and developed areas. 
Um, so we saw a low number of cases where we had that um, herbaceous land right next to a developed area. So an example of that would be like a grassy park in the middle of you know, downtown Richmond. It's grassy, it's herbaceous cover, but it's surrounded by developed land, which um, isn't, isn't really conducive to maintaining that disease transmission cycle. Just to take a look at what that edge might look like, here we see a forest uh, fragment that is surrounded by cropland, pasture land, grassy areas. And you can see that this perimeter is a pretty long perimeter and it's indicative of a forest fragment with the type of landscape configuration that supports the Lyme disease transmission cycle. So this result is very comparable to the findings that were done in the Northeast. Um, the Northeast has a, a different setting. Um, Lyme disease was typically associated with the suburbs of um, the major cities there. And we saw that as well in the area outside of Washington, DC. But as the disease continued moving southward into this area, for example, it's more rural and less suburban development, but we still see that relationship with forest patches and you know, thinking about this perimeter between the forest herbaceous edge. So an aerial photo of Floyd County, um, which, is, which has had a high number of cases in the, the past decade, it's very much a patchwork of forest and herbaceous cover. And the areas to the east and west of Blacksburg, this happens to be an image to the east of Blacksburg, um, you know, around here we see the right land cover and landscape configuration to support the Lyme disease transmission cycle too. So what it comes down to is that the, the, the decisions that we make when it comes to modifying and developing our land contributes greatly to Lyme disease risk. So when a new subdivision is built, the yards are often interspersed with patches of forest. It's a, it's a bucolic look in the distance. Residents like wandering through the forest. I like wandering through the forest. I, I lived in a neighborhood that was very much um, developed in that way. And I, I really enjoyed the, the variety of landscapes there. But that situation also creates the right setup for the Lyme disease transmission cycle. And given those relationships that we identified between Lyme disease and land cover in Virginia, we wanted to think about the future. What's the future story of Lyme disease? We wanted to consider what the future distribution of the disease could be as Lyme disease continues to spread possibly southward. So there's no predicting the future, but if we can start to estimate, get this idea in our head, can we start to estimate where diseases might be in the future? We can, we can better prepare for the possible occurrence. Maybe Lyme disease doesn't continue spreading southward. That would be great, but maybe it does. So let's, let's prepare and at least consider that possibility. So we used projected future land cover data to try to estimate Lyme disease risk in the future. So I showed you that map of land cover in Virginia. It was the same thing, but just projected into the future under a couple of different scenarios. So one scenario, these are uh, creatively labeled A and B scenarios, but the A scenarios had a decreased emphasis on conservation and they ended up with higher levels, high levels of fragmentation. So this would be a case where cities continue sprawling um, and forests continue to be um, cut into these patchwork fragments moving into the future. So the A scenarios had less of a focus on conservation and we saw higher levels of fragmentation in those cases. And that contrasts with the B scenarios where there was a shift toward more sustainable development practices, um, denser settlements and less urban sprawl. And under those scenarios, we saw re reduced or decreased forest fragmentation in the future. So again, these are land cover maps projected out into the future thinking, well, what if we decrease our emphasis on conservation? What would land cover look like? And then in the B scenario, well, what if we practiced you know, a more sustainable development model, then what would fragmentation look like? So these are kind of like possibilities for the future. And we wanted to consider Lyme disease under these different possibilities. So I have the state of Virginia, the Commonwealth circled there um, in red. And so we applied the results of our study within Virginia to the same ecoregions toward the south. 
So these are eco regions that are de defined by the Environmental Protection Agency, the EPA, and they're ones that you've heard of, the Ridge and Valley, the Blue Ridge, the Piedmont, and so on. So whatever EPA ecoregions were present in Virginia, we considered Lyme disease's distribution in those same ecoregions toward the south. So on the upcoming slides, you're going to see this funky shaped study area um, where we see this kind of almost U-shaped pattern um, with that southeastern plain going across, just skimming the top of um, northern Florida and then kind of whipping around north into Mississippi and Tennessee. So this is the shape that we'll be looking at um, as I share these results. So Lyme disease under these two scenarios that I'm gonna show you again, they're built using similar levels of population and economic growth. So we're still under A and B in, in the two that I'm gonna show you, the population's growing at roughly the same rate and same levels of economic growth. The thing that's different between the two is this approach toward conservation. So here we see the land cover suitability map for the Lyme disease transmission cycle for 2020 as kind of a baseline 2030 and 2040 under the southeast in that A scenario which had a minimal focus on conservation. So the areas with the darkest shades of gray and even getting into black are the places with the highest potential for Lyme disease. Those are the places where the land cover is projected to be highly suitable to support the disease transmission cycle. And now I'll add 2050, 2060, 2070, and then the last three decades of this century by 2100 in the bottom right, we see that land cover across much of the region under this A scenario with a reduced focus on conservation has a pretty high potential for the disease. So again, this is the um, setting or scenario where we see higher rates, higher levels of fragmentation that would be very conducive to supporting the transmission cycle. But what if there's a different possibility? What if instead of, of reducing our focus on conservation, we instead shift toward a different um, development pattern where we um, focus more on sustainable development and less on sprawl? So under the B scenario, again, greater emphasis on, on conservation and reducing forest fragmentation, we actually see a different future for Lyme disease in the Southeast. If you compare these two, the B scenario maps on the right have uh, a much smaller area that's shaded dark gray and black. So moving from 2020 in the top left to 2100 in the, the bottom right, um, we actually see a lower level of land cover suitability for Lyme disease across the Southeast than what we have right now. So the B scenario um, actually shows that reduction in Lyme disease suitability. So just as a summary, Lyme disease is projected to increase over time under the A scenario. So if we choose to, to develop the region with this reduced focus on conservation, and that contrasts with under this B scenario with an increased focus on sustainable development, we could actually see um, Lyme disease decrease under this particular scenario. So if we change our, our development approach to a more sustainable model with reduced forest fragmentation. So the idea with the findings of, of this study are that we can reduce Lyme disease risk by changing regional development practices. So there were actually two different A scenarios and two different B scenarios that we analyzed, and I didn't show you um, all of those map series. But this graph shows that the area for the highest land cover suitability for Lyme disease um, shows it increasing pretty significantly for, for one of those A scenarios in particular. And under both B scenarios, the area with the highest land cover suitability for Lyme disease actually decreases. So take home message, um, we can reduce Lyme disease risk by changing our practices and how land cover is modified and, and areas are developed, especially with how it's configured with respect to forest fragments and thinking about those edges between different land cover types. <laughs> 
Zooming in even more from these broad regional practices and considering um, individual backyards, the Connecticut Department of Health created um, this image, which shows a yard before quote unquote landscape intervention in which individual homeowners can take action to reduce the risk of exposure to ticks by cleaning up brush in the yard, um, mowing the grass shorter. And there's also, you can see a little stone wall and a, a mulched area that separates the yard from the wooded area. And then generally speaking, the, the brush is thin back. So even at the very local scale, the backyard scale, we can make modifications that can reduce our, our risk of Lyme disease. Even if the broader situation in which we're um, living has a relatively high risk. So if we return to this central tenet of landscape epidemiology, um, modifications that we make to the landscape can create or possibly prevent the establishment of disease cycles. And that can include in this case, reforestation and forest fragmentation. So I just wanna conclude and I'm happy to open it up for questions then. Our choices at the backyard level through regional development practices can limit or even increase the conditions for Lyme disease. And at times it creates an inherent contradiction that can be difficult to tackle. An action that can improve ecosystem health like the reforestation of the Eastern US can possibly increase the potential for a negative human health impact if that reforestation occurs under certain configurations. So what we see as a beneficial situation for physical and mental health for us even, like having forests near a residential development to, to walk through, can also increase the risk of Lyme disease. So it's a contradiction that can be difficult to sort through um, in terms of, of what we favor, or what we might value. So there are trade-offs to be made regarding what we value. Sometimes those things can be contradictory. Uh, but with modifications to our development practices, we, we can see a different future for Lyme disease. So I had a pretty big team of collaborators across different disciplines um, working on this, this project and a few grad students, and I want to acknowledge them here. And thank you for your time. I'd love to hear from you if you have comments or questions now, or you can contact me um, at the, the email address here. So with that, I'm happy to take any questions you might have. Wow, thank you, Corrine. <laughs> um, we have a few questions uh, in sure. the chat. I don't know if you can, if you want to look at them or I'll just yeah. kind of- Yeah, no, I can just pull them up and address them. Okay, so is the tick a passive vector or is it also affected by the pathogen? Um, the tick is able to survive being infected by the bacterium and continue its life cycle and, um, you know, lay eggs and everything. So it's, this isn't a case where the bacterium kills off the tick. Um, what effects, if any, do the other mammals and birds who act as reservoirs suffer from the pathogen? Um, they, if they are affected, they're not affected at high enough levels to stop the, the disease cycle. And I guess what comes to mind is West Nile virus, which affects um, crows and, and related birds. And they're actually killed by West Nile virus as they are also reservoirs of the disease. Um, so, you know, I haven't heard of specific situations where the mammals that are infected by the bacterium that serve as the reservoir are killed by it. Um, you may be familiar, of course, dogs and um, horses can be negatively impacted by Lyme disease as well, just like humans are. Um, but they, they also don't serve as reservoirs for the bacterium. So if a dog is infected with Lyme disease and a tick bites it, that tick is not gonna pick it up from the dog. So they are considered to be um, dead end hosts like humans are, where they're not a source of infection. Um, so the reservoirs are not affected at high enough levels um, where it, it reduces the diseases spread. How reliable is current Lyme disease testing? Uh, I, I can't tell you the latest and greatest on Lyme disease testing, but I know it has definitely been less than reliable over time. Um, the CDC has changed its reporting guidelines in terms of what it takes to be labeled a positive case. Um, if you remember seeing on the graph I showed, um, the more recent bars on the graph, part of it was one color, part of it was another color because some of them are labeled confirmed cases, 
but we can also have probable cases. So that's been um, a more recent change to the reporting guidelines in that even if we're not certain, we can label something as probable. So the tests have not always been reliable. Oftentimes, um, I know in the endemic area, which is the area where Lyme disease is just present, includes here and north, um, if, if a physician sees the rash on the skin, it's just, it's almost like a dead get giveaway that it's Lyme disease. And even if the test comes back negative, if there's a history of a tick bite plus that rash, it's considered to be a case. Um, so the, the um, tests have been uh, unreliable over time. Um, I do know that some, sometimes physicians in the endemic area, like here, Connecticut, you know, wherever, they don't even always test for Lyme disease and they don't always report their cases. And that is why the CDC estimates that it's an order of magnitude off. Instead of having 30,000 cases, we might have 300,000 cases. Um, I actually had, I gave a talk, I don't know if it was five or so years ago, and I had a physician come to the talk and he came and chatted with me after. It was really interesting talking to him, but he even said, he's like, yeah, I, I know Lyme disease is here. I don't bother reporting it. And I'm just like, my data, my data, I, I need you to report your cases. Um, so, you know, it is a reportable disease, but it's, it's definitely underreported. Uh, oh, this is a great question. A prairie type garden, encourage or discourage ticks? I, I would say if it's taller grass, it could encourage ticks. However, if it's in, in, in an area of the yard where it's separated off from the, if there is an area that's mowed, it, as, it seems as though as long as there's some type of boundary, like the, the Connecticut recommendation was that section of mulch and a little stone wall, um, if there would be less contact. But again, at the same time, you know, you can put in one type of garden, which is great for native species, uh, which is definitely a thing that's valued, but it might increase the risk of Lyme disease. So it's a matter of balancing those two goals. Um, but I do know that having some type of boundary is, is something that helps at least. Um, the movement of ticks as well as the movement of, of small mammals. What type of forest is utilized for projections of the reduced fragmentation? Yeah, so that's a great question. And I would have to, honestly, I can't answer that. What type of forest was projected into these future land cover maps? I know they had deciduous and evergreen forests separated out and they were projecting them differently. So I'm not sure if they considered, um, you know, exactly how they considered that, that distribution and difference with deciduous and, um, and uh, evergreen forests in the future. But if you want to follow up with me, Bruce, I'd be happy to dig into that paper that goes into the subtle little details of, of those land cover maps. Lyme disease. So yeah, good question about Lyme disease starting in the US. So actually, it probably did not start in the US, but probably we have our version of Lyme disease and there's another version of Lyme disease in Europe. So it is, it is present in Europe and it's not called Lyme disease. Um, I can't remember the name off the top of my head. So it's likely that they both, both of these versions of Lyme disease um, kind of developed over a very long time um, and that the European equivalent of Lyme disease has a relatively long history in Europe. Um, I've not heard anything about South America. So in order for it to be introduced to another part of the world, there would have to be a highly competent reservoir in that place, like an already existing population and they would have to also have the tick population present as well. Um, you know, it's not the dog tick that's transmitting Lyme disease, it's the black-legged tick, used to be called the deer tick. Um, so we would need the right ingredients present in other parts of the world to support the Lyme disease transmission cycle. Um, and then if it got introduced, like if somebody took a white-footed mouse to some other part of the world, if the tick was present and a you know competent reservoir there, then maybe we could see it becoming established. Um, but I'm not sure about the spread to South America. 
Um, there is, there's a lot of questioning going on in the Lyme disease research community about this continued spread toward the South. So about eight to 10 years ago, so Yale has a huge Lyme disease research center. I mean, there are so many experts there and, um, you know, they've been doing a lot of work on thinking about the risk of Lyme disease and maybe predicting its spread. And there was a little bit of a debate in a research journal, um, a little bit of an argument. I love that when that happens um, with Yale saying, no, Lyme disease is not present in North Carolina. And the North Carolina Department of Health saying, um, yes, it is. We have cases, you know, Wake County is now considered to be endemic for Lyme disease. So there's a lot of debate over this possible continued south, uh, southern spread, um, southward spread of Lyme disease, because as we move southward, we get into other other animals that are present in a forest patch or forest fragment. And it's thought that maybe, um, you know, areas where, for example, there are more lizards in a place where if the ticks are feeding on lizards, they're not picking up Lyme disease. Maybe that's something that would limit the, the movement of Lyme disease. So there's a lot of question about um, this, this southward spread just because we get into different, different animal species. Um, yes, I, as far as I know, possums do eat, do eat ticks. And I don't know about patch, uh, forest fragments and, and possums. That's a great question. So there is actually a team of researchers in the Fisheries and Wildlife Science Department that are looking at a local scale study of um, you know, collecting ticks and collecting mammals to check the infection rate. So that's really like zooming in on the ideas I shared here. And it would be fascinating to look at if we could also get a sense of how many possums are in an area and, and to try to really tease out that relationship um, with places that have high numbers of possums and high numbers, you know, and then compare it to Lyme disease. So my understanding is that possums do eat large numbers of ticks. And I just, I haven't heard if there's even been research done thinking about what forest fragments do for their populations. So that's a great question. Um, definitely something that we could do some research on. Uh, forest service, increasingly interested in prescribed burning of forest. Will that potentially change Lyme disease environmental transmission characteristics? So I would say, um, you know, with, with prescribed burning being implemented, typically it's implemented in a place that has historically seen fire anyway, and it's, you know, it's a healthy kind of natural <laughs> part of that ecosystem. Um, so that is something, you know, a prescribed burn could, could probably create a healthier forest with less brush and less buildup. But at the same time, any activity that creates an edge or takes an intact forest and kind of chops it up into smaller pieces could potentially um, increase that risk of, of disease transmission. I think generally speaking though, prescribed burns are conducted in places that are less populated, more intact forests in the, in the first place. So I can't imagine that that would have a huge impact long-term at least, um, because after the burn, then we start to see recovery in the forest and it, you know, those native species are, are hopefully growing back um, and creating that balance in the forest. Um, but, but things that create edges, any kind of development that could create an edge might, might have an increase. Um, other types of ticks that carry, can carry Lyme disease. Not that I have heard of, but I know there are a lot of tick-borne diseases that we are still learning about um, in the Southeast. So ehrlichiosis is another um, tick-borne illness, um, Rocky Mountain spotted fever. Talk about naming a disease after a place. It's a total misnomer. Rocky Mountain spotted fever, the kind of epicenter is, is actually North Carolina. So you think of Rocky Mountain spotted fever and think, oh, it's not a problem around here, but, but it is. So I haven't heard of other ticks carrying Lyme disease, but I know other ticks carry other tick-borne illnesses. And there really is a lot we don't know about tick-borne illnesses. Um, you know, we're not sure what they, what they do to people. You know, Lyme disease can have these really weird symptoms that make it difficult to treat um, long-term. And these other tick-borne diseases can as well. But I'll, I'll dig in and see if I can find anything about other ticks carrying Lyme disease. So that's, that's good to know about, thank you. Yes, we love possums. Um, what about deer mice? Um, so I can't say for sure about deer mice being a reservoir. From what I've heard, they are not. Uh, what I connect deer mice with actually is hantavirus, um, which is less common here, more common out west. I have not heard of deer mice being 
as competent of a reservoir as the white-footed mouse would be. So there are other mammals that can harbor Lyme disease, the bacterium as a reservoir, but the white-footed mouse is kind of like the, the cream of the crop, right, for being the competent reservoir. So the deer mouse may be a reservoir, but not at the same level as the white-footed mouse. So I think I've gone through everything in the chat. I'm happy to answer anything else that comes up or again, feel free to email me. Thank you, Kareen. You Thank are a wealth you. of information. Well, I really enjoyed it. I, I love talking about Lyme disease. Uh, I wish I didn't have anything to talk about though. <laughs> <laughs> Well, thank you so much. Uh, and I'll, I'll be catching up with you soon. But, you know, you're causing me to have to really rethink a few things about forest edges. Oh, I know. I rethink it myself. I love being out in the woods and I love seeing them in the distance. And oftentimes they're kind of patchy. So it's like everything's a trade off, right? <laughs> Well, it is. And, you know, anytime you're hiking, as soon as you start walking through the grassy areas, leaving the woods, going to grassy areas, you know, you need to start looking for ticks. Right, right. So and of course, what you sense, but you've, you've really drawn attention to that. Thank you. Yeah, thank, thank you very you. much for having me.